Been sleeping for too long. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Like endo flame, it's time to wake up. Come to your senses, man. Snow is all around you, but you don't play in the winter game. Cartridges surround you, but you ain't playing Nintendo games. Load them up. Greetings and welcome back to the Woke Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Jones. And on today's episode, we chop it up with Willie Jackson, who is the president and CEO of Equity Impact Group. He's also the founder and publisher of Abernathy Magazine, which is uh, one of the things that I follow him on and hopefully will be a contributor of very, very soon. And he's also, and this is how I actually found him, he's also a technical lead with Seth Godin's Alt MBA. And if folks don't know who Seth Godin is, uh, just you know, put his name in YouTube or Google and you will find uh, a lot of constructive information from Seth Godin. But this brother right here, Mr. Willie Jackson, has a lot of good constructive information on tech, on entrepreneurship and just on uh being a black person in general we chop it up about dealing with our own emotional um and mental health uh being black content creators and just you know finding different ways for us to deal with our issues and keep striving through life so be sure to tune into the episode also be sure to follow us on twitter at the woke podcast on twitter um, if you have any questions for me, I'm Jones at the woke, at wokepodcast.com. And if you have not subscribed to the podcast, please do so. You can do that on iTunes, Google Play, uh, tune in. We're on every platform you can think of. You can find the woke podcast. And as always, be sure to save the podcast. Be sure to share the podcast with uh, someone you care about. Be safe, be constructive, be woke, and enjoy the interview. All right, we are rolling. All right, so Mr. Jackson, can you tell folks who you are? I'm sure a lot of my listeners have not come across you or, or know anything about Abernathy Magazine. Some of them may know about Seth Godin. That's how I found you. <laughs> um, so just who are you? Who are you? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Brandon. I wake up every day uh, asking myself the same question. Uh, my name is Willie Jackson, W-I-L-L-I-E. Thank you, Dad, for this country name. Um, <laughs> I was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I currently live in Harlem, New York City. Uh, I'm the publisher and founder of an online magazine for black men called Abernathy. It's abernathymagazine.com. Uh, I'm a technologist by trade. I do a little tech consulting for folks like uh, my advisor, Seth Godin, and um, working with him on uh, a 30-day online leadership program called Alt-MBA, A-L-T-M-B-A.com. And I help uh, organizations think about what it means to be inclusive and to um, espouse notions of equity and to re- really think about how to create a, uh, a thoughtful workplace environment for folks who look like us, um, and historically uh, underrepresented minorities in the workplace, and Um, mostly I'm someone who uh, sees a lot of things in the world that aren't good enough and I'm trying really, really hard to do something about them. Nice. Nice. And Abernathy Magazine, I know the name has a significance to it. I've heard bits and pieces of why the magazine's named Abernathy. Can you explain to listeners why Abernathy Magazine? Absolutely. So um, I grew up relatively um, privileged or fortunate, I'd say, for a person of color, specifically a black person in the United States. And there are some good sides of that and there were some bad sides of that. The good side of that is I didn't directly come up against a lot of the oppression um, that a lot of our people experience in our community. Um, the downside is because I did not grow up in a household that was particularly conscious, as I would say, um, I didn't know how bad things were, frankly, for a lot of folks who look like me. <clears throat> and so it took several high-profile police shootings in particular over the past few years to really snap me out of my um, ignorance. And it was Mike Brown's death in particular that uh, completely rocked my world. Mm-hmm. And I was really active on social media at the time, and I saw those very first tweets of folks saying, you know, you shot this brother out, lying in the street, and uh, on and on and on. And that turned into night after night, because, you know, law enforcement only provoked during the evening, Mm -hmm. uh, night after night of our fellow countrymen being provoked and tear-gassed and harassed 
and um, all manner of destruction. And honestly, Brendan, it changed me. Uh, I will never be the same again after seeing those events. Mm-hmm. And so I had this new rage, this new terror, this new fear, these feelings to contend with. I had never felt so black in my own skin. And um, just dealing with what that felt like and what that meant. And I, I felt really um, I felt really confused because um, I, I needed to fill in the blanks. And so I started reading a lot more. I started reading um, a lot of, not just articles, because that's, that's great, but I started going to some really important texts. Uh, I started watching some documentaries. I started asking some questions. I started really uh, leaning into the work of activism and community organizing um, from a learning perspective, not that I was out in the streets myself, but I followed in particular on social media a lot of folks who were. And I really started to understand how different the world was uh, when we tell our own stories. And so fast forward to me wanting to do something uh, productive that didn't involve shotguns and ski masks and burning down the state house. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm a technologist and, uh, and I'm a writer. And <clears throat> I know a lot of folks who um, really care about the way that our world looks and feels for black and brown and oppressed folks across the globe. And so I, I channeled my energy into an online magazine for black men, and I wanted to name it um, something significant. And you know, as you and many of your listeners know, uh, Dr. Ralph David Abernathy was Dr. Martin Luther King's best friend and right-hand man. He was instrumental in some of the most important civil rights um, and voting legislation that was passed. And most people... Uh, outside of uh, the quote-unquote black history or civil rights circles, don't know who Reverend Albert Abernathy is uh, or was. Uh, he unfortunately passed away. And the reason for that is because he told the truth. And in his memoir, he shared that Dr. King was, like many brothers, um, a big fan of women, and he had women on the side maybe even the night before he was assassinated. And for this truth-telling, he was um, more or less excommunicated from the black civil rights community at the time. <clears throat> and I thought it was a, a, a travesty, a travesty, let me try this in English, a travesty. <laughs> and I, I, I thought it was a powerful metaphor for something that you don't know that perhaps you should. And so we launched on, on January 29th, almost two years ago. And um, we published about three times a week. We're approaching... 300 articles. It'll be more than 300 by the time that folks hear this conversation. And um, honestly, I'm having the time of my life. There's nobody who's benefited more from what we publish than me. There's no, no one who's uh, learned more, who's experienced more. Uh, to tell many brothers, many young brothers in particular, who are told no every day, uh, yes. You know, we, we are happy to put your ideas in front of this audience. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we need to see ourselves. So our mission is to amplify the good news, to point towards what we really need to do in our communities, specifically in the black male communities around misogyny and sexism and self-love and empowerment, and really unwinding and pushing back against these notions of hyper-masculinity, toxic masculinity, and understanding what it means and, and where that's coming from. And, you know, this increasingly is getting into your territory around uh, intergenerational trauma, black male healing, and so forth. So uh, I'll pause there, but that's the thinking behind uh, and the genesis of AbernathyMagazine.com. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now you, the, the way that I learned about you, like I said, was through Seth Godin. I was looking at all MBA, trying to figure out how am I going to, you know, get this money and get to New York to go. Mm. <laughs> and so it's online. I, now, I know it's online now, but with the first one, the first, I think it was the, yeah. Wasn't, yeah. The, cause oh, we, had did a, it, we, did it, we did a, we did an event. We did a big a, event yeah, up here yeah. uh, in Westchester. Um, you're probably talking yes. about the Ruckus Makers event. Yep. So, um, <laughs> yep, okay. Yep. So, um, so I know, so one of the things when I learned about you, you kind of struck me because I'm, I was trying to figure out who are all these black folks in tech? Where are they? I know they're out there. Mm-hmm. I know they're far a few in between. Who are they? I ran into Anthony Frazier. Um, I ran into folks like Tristan Walker, who probably is the one that everyone knows with Bevel. Um, sure. and, and then I ran into you, and you stuck with me because of Abernathy Magazine. Can you talk a little bit about 
you know, being a person of color in general, but it's more specific, specifically a black male in tech, how important it is to have us in those spaces um, and to do work like what you're doing. Because, I mean, you, you are in that field, but you're not necessarily doing what a lot of people would consider to be tech work at the moment. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So there are two parts of it. First, it, it, it needs to be stated that I uh, I don't have a day job. Um, I made the leap to self employment and doing my own projects about six years ago. <clears throat> and uh, the reason I did that is not just because I don't there's like people telling me what to do for myself, but um, when I looked at what my career would entail, if I gave a nameless, faceless corporate behemoth uh, the best years of my life. It just wasn't good enough. You know, I, I, I can get a big house and a boat and a convertible and two divorces on my own. I don't need a company to sponsor that. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I, I started by doing a little freelancing, a little web design and development on the side. I wasn't very good, but I was good enough. And building my skills, understanding what it took to run a business or to be a freelancer. And I had a good thing going for me. So back in 2010, April, is when I quit. The story was actually pretty dramatic, but we can uh, perhaps circle back there. Uh, so anyway, I, I left my job and I've been more or less self-employed since then. I was working in the technology field. I was working for a huge company, um, their global company, but I was based out of the Atlanta office uh, for almost four years, a company called Accenture. So I was, I was living on an airplane. I was, I was flying twice a week. I was living out of a suitcase. I mean, everything was great until you know it, it wasn't. And it was actually, a pre- it still is actually a really diverse organization. So a lot of horror stories that you hear around uh, what it's like to be a black person in tech or in the corporate world in general, that wasn't my story. And mm-hmm. so this all ties into the, the conundrum of Willie Jackson because I, I have to grapple with the fact that I haven't lived a life where white folks have been terrible to me. I haven't lived a life where police have uh, terrorized me. I haven't lived a life where... I've been subjected to discrimination and oppression. I've lived a life of opportunity and abundance. But I have to reconcile that with the very real lived experiences of a lot of folks who look like us and also understanding that my career in many ways is an anomaly. And I'm still unwinding a lot of the sacrifices made by my parents and others to get me to the point where this stuff seems trivial in retrospect. So, for example, I started interning back in 2005 through a nonprofit organization called Inroads. It's at inroads.org. And you know, their spiel is they prepare talented underserved youth for uh, business and industry leadership. So in 2005, I cut my braids off and uh, <laughs> you know, I suited up and I, I went into the, the working world. It wasn't a very mm-hmm. interesting internship, but that exposure, that mentorship, that leadership development, that sense of camaraderie, seeing so many black folks um, you know, for whom success was almost a foregone conclusion, um, that was useful in shaping my trajectory because I knew I was smart. I knew I was talented. Uh, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And yeah. so I entered the working world like everybody else. When I graduated from college in 07, I went to Florida State down in Tallahassee. <clears throat> and I, I really wanted to work for myself. I just didn't know what I wanted to do or what that even looked like. So, you know, off to the plantation I went. And uh, I had a great career. And I think looking back, as I see how this conversation around uh, quote-unquote diversity and inclusion in tech goes, uh, it's so critical that we continue talking about this for a few reasons. First of all, most people don't realize that the reason we're having this conversation in the first place is because of Jesse Jackson. Mm. What Jesse Jackson does through the Rainbow Push Coalition is buys, uh, he buys shares of publicly traded stocks for these huge technology companies based out of Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And he goes to the shareholder meetings and says, where are the black people on our board? The most gangster thing ever. Mm-hmm. And that's actually the reason that a few years ago, uh, Google released um, what you call an EEO one report. Um, it, it's essentially a report saying this is how many folks we have with these identities. Yeah. Um, and that's what got the industry talking. So a lot of credit is given to these technology organizations for being, um, inclusive and progressive, or at least beginning this conversation. But the real story and the responsibility I have not only as a technologist and as a publisher is to give credit where it's due and to honor our leaders and the black folks uh, who have come before us and who have taken the civil rights movement and continue this work despite what it seems like. 
uh, in 2016 or 2017, depending on when this is reaching your ears, uh, yeah. dear listener. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's absolutely critical because when you look at the numbers, uh, and it, this is not unique to tech, right? The, the reason we talk a lot about the technology industry is because tech is sexy. Uh, yeah. It's hot. You know, fortunes are being made. Multi-billion dollar companies are being birthed in dorm rooms. But such a vanishingly small fraction of capital, um, specifically you know, venture capital and investment, uh, and even angel investment, <clears throat> goes to founders who look like us. Yeah. And you know, there are folks in Silicon Valley, uh, Michael Siebel, who's head of Y Combinator, Chris um, uh, of course, uh, Wayne Sutton, who's been doing really, really important work through the Tech Inclusion Conference, and uh, his um, BC firm, Build Up, Build Up BC, uh, dozens and dozens of others. But <clears throat> we need hundreds more. We need thousands more. And so what I try to do with my platform, and by the time the listeners hear this, we'll be publishing our Tech Spotlight series, um, what we have an opportunity for with this platform is to talk about the ways in which discrimination is everywhere. Because if you look in finance, if you look in law, if you look in the medical world, the numbers are just as bad, if not worse. Yeah. Yep. And so there's an opportunity here um, to um, be relevant and to hold these companies accountable. You look at a company like Twitter that has a, like a 29, 30% black user base. Mm-hmm. but a 1% black workforce. Mm. Like I, where I'm from, we call that discrimination. Yeah. Yep. So I, it, and, and when you look at the culture that emerges around black Twitter and how influential the hip hop um, culture is and the millennial generation is and the folks uh, coming up behind us are in how the world sees itself from mm-hmm. Hollywood with the, the Kardashians and the Jenners to you know, the, the influence of music and the memes and popular culture and even the words that our, yeah. our president is using. Yeah. Um, we are, we are owed uh, some credit. We owed a lot more than credit. We're owed a lot more than we can really talk about on this mm-hmm. podcast. And so I feel a responsibility as a successful black male technologist uh, to use my platform and my voice uh, to say the things that our um, brothers and sisters who feel hopeless um, don't have the platform to say. Absolutely. Yeah, wow. And so, so I have a question about that because I, you know, I want to make sure that the people who listen to this don't think that the responsibility is just in tech. You know, as content creators, I think that it's extremely important important for our, us to get our voices out and to get them out in ways where everybody's learning from them. Um, and one thing that I end up seeing a lot is that as content creators, uh oh. Oh, there you go. As content creators, what ends up happening is we focus more on the entertainment and less on the educational pieces. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, with Abernathy, I see that differently. And, you know, before we started the podcast, I talked about another publication that I seen them go in the entertainment direction when I thought they were going into the more educational direction. I think that both are needed. And I think there's a way to make some of the educational, you know, and, and more social information sexy like tech. Um, but how do we do that as black content creators from your perspective? Last year I had an opportunity to see uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates at the Schomburg Center in Harlem where I live. Mm. And he was responding to the unexpected success of Between the World and Me and mm. a lot of the criticism received from Dr. Cornell West and others. And what he said was powerful. I think it's, it's really relevant to this conversation. There needs to be a done between the world and these. There needs to be so much more in this space so people can do whatever they want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I should be able to do what I'm doing with my magazine. <clears throat> my brother should be able to do what they want to do. Uh, Blavity should be able to do what they want to do. And we should be irreverent. We should be funny. We should be educational. We should, be, we should show up in the world however we want. <clears throat> and, you know, my... Their set of concerns is not the same as either of those publications, and right. so yeah, there's space for us all to eat. I care very. So I'll say it like this: Abernathy is very much an expression of my uh, growing black awakening. You know, kind of how we talked about it at the top of the call. And yep. so a lot of my focus, just because of who I am, is going to be um, I- emotional and intellectual and heady and cerebral, and you know, really digging into these topics. But 
<clears throat> if you learn, if you, if you see, and I, I know that you've noticed this already, most of what we publish is contributed by people who have a point of view and who have something to say. So I write the newsletter, people hear from me every week, but most of what we publish is what people have to say in the world. And so I'm naturally attracting, just by virtue of the signal that I'm putting out, the kind of folks who think about the world in this general direction and who have a sense for that. So we do a tiny bit of curation on the editorial mm -hmm. side, but mostly we publish what's submitted. So what has emerged from that um, isn't necessarily something that I set out to do in the way that we're doing it. It kind of happened. I didn't have a grand vision. I don't have a background in publishing. I've, you know, I've, I've published books. I've made books before, literally made books with uh, them back in 2011 through this project with Amazon.com called Domino Project. Mm -hmm. But in terms of having a media company, um, I, nobody told me how to do this. Nobody gave me permission. Um, so I just did it. And what has emerged from that is a, a direction and I think you've noticed I've, I've found my voice and my lane and my angle, and I'm yep. really, really leaning into that. But by the same token, we need media outlets. Uh, and yep. the reason we need media outlets, uh, not only because, you know, being, enjoy, being um, free and having fun and enjoying ourselves is uh, a revolutionary act in times like this, we need large companies spending large dollars on sites like Blavity. You know, shout out yep. to Blavity, uh, Morgan mm -hmm. Dawn, and, and those folks doing really, really important work. You know, shout out to Damon at um, you know Very Smart Brothers who uh, really pulls no punches and and and, yeah. <laughs> and writes his truths um, yep. in a way that is visceral and hilarious and uh, they've got a great group of folks over there. So I really think there's enough for all of us to eat, and I don't think anybody necessarily needs to change what they're doing. I think on the contrary, we need to feel empowered to do whatever the hell we want because right. to your point. We're all content creators. We are all media companies. You know, through SoundCloud and WordPress and uh, a lot of free tools available to us, you know, anybody listening can today become a publisher. And the only difference between what I'm doing and the person who hasn't started yet is that I'm in motion, right? right. And so, I mean, these are just ideas. Abernathy is a website, a blog. If, if we lost power and the internet went out, there would be nothing. Um, mm. But then again, there would be everything because we are reflecting a consciousness and we are galvanizing a moment in time and we are, um, you know, cultivating an audience of folks who show up in the world uh, in a thoughtful way and who really care deeply about these issues that we're discussing. So I, I really think we can all live. I think we can all eat and we just need more folks in, in this game so we can um, you know, have a diversity of perspectives um, and conversations going on. Absolutely. Yes. So I'm going to transition a little bit um, to the last uh, article. Or not, I don't know if this was your last article, one of your more recent ones, uh, The Cure of Ambivalence. I thought this was yeah. a very, very powerful article, um, good way to kind of round out the year. Um, can you tell us what kind of sparked your, your mind to go here? What was happening for you when you wrote The Cure of Ambivalence? Yeah, so The, the Cure of Ambivalence – recent newsletter article was an encapsulation of really where I was thinking at the time. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's essentially um, a story, a bit about how I started talking today, about how growing up the Black History Month and Civil Rights Movement didn't really capture my interest or imagination um, because I didn't get it. I was not yet conscious. I wasn't connected to the story and the experience of discrimination and racism because those weren't my experiences. And I related that culturally to what it was like growing up in the church and observing our traditions, but almost feeling like um, an outsider or a bystander uh, in this pre-existing culture into which, I, into which I was born. And then I talked a little bit about the experience of uh, Mike Brown's death and how that was personal and how it radicalized me and how it changed me and how it you know, um, caused me to deal with a lot of these feelings of confusion and rage and pain. Um, that I had to address at once as a, you know, as a grown ass man. And I, I tied it off with an experience, um, you know, with a summary of my experience speaking at the Whitney M. Young conference at Wharton uh, in Philadelphia. Um, my buddy Chris Merriweather, you know, shout out to the Zuboff family. Um, my buddy Chris Merriweather is finishing up his MBA there and he's going to speak at their conference. This is the uh, 43rd annual uh, conference. And it's just a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Um, conference and it reminded me a lot of my time in inroads back what 11 years ago a room full of um, black folks who really um, were really out here getting it you know in, 
mm-hmm. in finance, in uh, various areas of business and tech, uh, leaders from all over the nation. I met some unbelievable folks. And what I try to tie together is this narrative of where I am, where I was coming from, and how um, this is my particular set of experiences. Here's how I'm coming at it. And this is why I feel a moral imperative to talk about this work, to do the work that I'm doing, and to bring the fullness of who I am as a black male technologist, entrepreneur, publisher, consultant, into everything that I do. And to, to feel um, free in some ways to, to bring that into all these spaces because, I, you know, I quit my job so I can do whatever the hell I want. I, I, and once you're empowered, you don't have to work for yourself to, uh, to operate in this freedom and, or in this mindset. And I'm not talking about like a Dave Chappelle keeping it real goes wrong. Like I'm, I'm not out here living like that. <laughs> right. what, what I'm saying is the, the freedom emotionally and cognitively that comes from understanding that you can speak your truth and watch the universe bend to your will. Um, there, there's something liberating about that consciousness. And we don't need to associate this with rigid notions of employment or not or making money or not because money is not real. When's the last time you had $100,000 in your hand? When's the last time you had $1,000 in your hand? Money is not real. Money is an idea. And as Seth talks about, <clears throat> what really, really matters is the story we tell ourselves. Money is a story, right? And so the reason I charge a lot for my time and my expertise is because I care a lot about myself because of my self-image, because of how I see myself in the world. And honestly, and I know you'll get this, I have to do it because I'm the grandson of sheriff's office. You know, mm-hmm. I, my antecedents did not own the land they cultivated for their entire lives. Right. My father was born in 1944 and picked cotton in the segregated South. I have to own what I do. I have to charge a premium for my time and my attention. I have to interrupt the cycle of poverty uh, in my bloodline because I'm not passing that along. I don't want that to be my story. So a lot of what I do in the world, um, from writing and speaking and publishing and consulting, is less about what objectively needs to be done and more about me projecting my internal journey to being well and being whole and being um, who I am. Um, in public, because I found a way to do that that sustains me financially and that brings me joy. So I don't know if any of that answers your question, but yes. the article, the article <laughs> in question is uh, is called the cure for ambivalence. And uh, if you listen to this, I'd love for you to check it out and let me know what you think. Yes, and please subscribe to the newsletter as well. Or right. they're all. I mean, pretty much every article I've read, I've got something from it. It's not a waste of your time. I sign up for a lot of news articles, letters, <laughs> and I unsubscribe to a lot, but Abernathy has been one that I've been rocking with from the Appreciate beginning. That. So, yeah, That's absolutely. Good. Yeah, I think I, I think I would subscribe just to your website first before Abernathy came along. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Man, one of the things listening to you that I, that I want to make sure that comes across clearly is that healing is not a destination. Healing is a journey. And, you know, I do a lot of trainings and I'm in a lot of trainings of mental health and, you know, healing and trauma has been kind of the buzz over the last six years or so. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people talk about healing as it's like this destination that you get to like, oh, I'm healed and I'm good. Not understanding that for a lot of the things that happen to us that are traumatic, it doesn't just end there. Like we still live with the memories. We still live with the scars. Right. We still live with the people that may have hurt us or in those same mm-hmm. environments. It's a journey, and it's about learning how to cope and exist and be who you are to your fullest potential in those journeys. And that's what I'm hearing from you is like, you know, you're on your journey. You took a big leap, uh, re- actually two big leaps <laughs> recently in your journey. You're still moving forward, and that's what's important because um, I think we get caught on this, you know, I have to, you know, heal, and I'm going to be okay, and it's like that's not how it works. Um, right. So in the work that I do, I try to put, keep people going. And it's really it's self-help and it's, you know, motivational interview or motivational speaking and things like that. But it's really you doing that dirty work. You really dealing right. with your own emotions and your own self. And I hear that a lot in your story, which is which is awesome. Honestly, Brandon, I think the most important work we do um, on and for ourselves as humans, especially as um, humans who originate from the African diaspora, uh, is the internal work. Like, yes. My life has transformed. Uh, been transformed by the work that I've done on myself to make myself uh, okay and to understand the degree to which this is not optional because, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have both of my parents and I grew up um, comfortably. I never needed anything growing up. Yet and still, I have suffered tremendously and I 
I've suffered in silence and I'm never, ever, ever going back to that dark place again. And because those memories will remain with me for the rest of my life and because I know what it feels like to be around the resources I need but to feel like I'm dying, mm. uh, I don't want anybody to experience that again. Uh, I don't want anybody to experience that unnecessarily. I know I can't change everything, but by living my life out loud and by having conversations like these about mental and emotional health, I feel confident that people will feel more empowered to lift up their hand and say, I am not okay. And there are a lot of brothers like you, a lot of brothers like Sam Simmons who have been doing this work for a long time. I'm new to this space. Like I told you um, before we started recording, I didn't know this was a thing. Yeah. But now that I've found it, I can't believe uh, the government isn't unri- underwriting this work uh, nationally, uh, you know, for the tune of $100 million. Like this is yeah. the most essential work I can possibly think of. Because if you heal, if, if you heal and fix black men, you heal and fix America. Oh, boom. <laughs> you just drop a flex bomb right there. Like, for real. I mean, honestly, I mean it. it's, 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 it is critical. It is critical. And, you know, a lot of times we just think of healing black men or working with black men is treating, is treating symptoms, right? Looking at cr- criminal justice, um, you know, looking at father's programs and things like that. But th- those are symptoms to a bigger issue here. I mean, and that's what, you know, the work that I do is understanding that that's a bigger issue. And it didn't start with that one particular man that you're working with or that guy that you're working with. Like, this is generations of stuff that has been passed that's down. Right. That's and, right. and, that's, and that's the understanding. And honestly, in my practice, the people that I work with, whether it's groups, families, couples, or individuals, when, I, when I'm able to help them craft a context for what they've been through and the people who came before them have been through, they really start to improve because I give them mm-hmm. – I, I don't give them. I help them discover a label for what's been going on. They're not necessarily, quote, unquote, right. crazy. That's what black folks think. Whenever we have challenges, we think that we're just crazy, and it's not that mm-hmm. we're crazy. It's that something has happened, and that something that happened should not have happened. That's right. And and we have to keep moving forward, even though it has happened. And we can still be great and still do great things. And and that's the key. That's the key. Well, not only are we not crazy, um, one of the one of the really sinister elements of this is we don't know our history. We are people disembodied. We are people disconnected from our history and our stories. So we don't understand the context for our existence. Uh, the, Black history was literally whitewashed from the textbooks. There are roughly 12 textbooks used to teach American history in the United States. There's a brilliant book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Uh, mm-hmm. You can link to that in the show notes or you, know, you can yep. put that in front of your audience. But it is such an important book that talks about how deeply, deeply ahistorical we are as a culture. It wasn't until I understood the horrors of convict leasing and the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade and the horrors that were state sponsored that I developed an outrage um, for the way that black folks are existing. Yeah, well, I'm gonna get emotional every time I talk about this, but I saw this meme that says they, they kill our daddies and blame us for being fatherless. Mm. And um, I, well, the, the thoughts that come up when I think about the emotion of the children who feel that but don't have the words to articulate that makes me want to burn this whole thing down. Yeah. And because I can't, I can't go out like that. I'm no good for the movement if I'm locked up. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep it moving. But, yeah. brother, we have got work to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely will link the book. Uh, I'm familiar with that book. I haven't read it, but I am familiar with it. But, yeah, it's, it's deep. And, and it's very important as black men that we work collectively. I think that's one of our, our struggles. And I have that struggle damn near weekly here in the twin cities where there's not a lot of black people and we should be working together because there's not a lot of us, but it's a struggle. I can get the sisters to work with me and get stuff done. But when it comes to working with black men is very hard. And, and that is due to our trauma and how we've been conditioned to operate with each other in, in very nasty ways. Um, but it's very hard to organize. So, you know, having conversations and talking to you and seeing what you're putting together gives not only gives me hope, but gives me motivation to keep doing what I do. Because I, I think we're about, I think we're close to the same age. You say you graduated in 07 uh, from college. I graduated in 08. So I'm 31. We, we, all right. Yeah. So I'm 30. <laughs> so 
you know, we we are we are what we have. Like we are the generation that is going to, I think, going to lay some foundation. We have a lot of people who are ahead of us, um, who gave us some critical tools that we have to apply. So, so yes, um, it it's very it's very important for us to do the work that we that we have to do. Very important. So yeah, um, any projects that you have coming up uh, here in the next couple months in 2017 that you want to let folks know about? Oh my God! Thank you so much for asking. I um, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of really interesting things going on. So the corporate training work I do. So if you work for a thoughtful organization that's looking to put a focus on diversity and inclusion, uh, I hold my nose when I talk about those topics because um, you know they become useless buzzwords and companies hide behind them because it's a checkbox. But what I help companies do is turn those slogans into actual action. And so if you have, if you're uh, an employee of a company that has an employee resource group or a focus uh, around making these um, initiatives worthwhile, uh, I'd love to talk. So um, that's, that's one thing I, um, I'm, I'm focusing on in the new year, and that's at equityimpactgroup.com. Uh, so I do my work through there. Um, separately, we'll continue, be, we'll continue publishing articles. Uh, the work of the magazine will continue and, and will grow. And uh, that's at abernathymagazine.com. So if you're a writer <clears throat> or somebody with a point of view, you have to be a black male. Uh, you know, part of our work, um, part of our mission in the magazine is to hold space for black women and to understand uh, the ways in which we as black men have subjugated uh, the voice of black women, and uh, we need to understand the ways in which, you know, this work and this mission for me personally means amplifying the voices of women uh, and holding space for them on our platform. So women are um, always welcome to contribute, and you don't have to be black. You know, this struggle is universal. This notion of anti-blackness crazily is global. This is not an American phenomenon. We need everybody to be a part of this. In fact, many of our subscribers are white people who have married into or adopted black children. And suddenly they're confronted with this new reality, this new way of um, showing up in the world that is responsible for a life that is so incredibly vulnerable and whose lived experiences are so unlike their own. Um, so we're always open to and looking for writers. Um, I live in Harlem and I'm doing a lot of work in the event marketing space. We just did a, a great event last month. We'll be doing another big one in February. So if you check out CollaborateHarlem.com. Um, that's where you can find out about some of our upcoming projects and um, live events. So that'll be a fun series. We're going to be doing a great, great party in February, uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek Black History party where there will be trap music and we'll be getting down. Cause it's not just about going to the library. we got to turn up, too. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll have, we have projects going on in Oakland and in – um, Harlem, and there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Maybe we'll uh, have a separate conversation as some of these things get fleshed out. Um, but if you're a technologist, uh, I'd love to hear from you in particular because we've got an upcoming Tech Spotlight series. So writers, technologists, black people who care, black people who turn up. Um, my email address is, uh, you want to give it here or you want to share it? Well, I'll, I'll just share it. It's, yeah, go um, for it. It's Willie, W I L L I E. Uh, w i l l i e at WillieJackson.com. dot com is my personal note, and um, shoot me a note. I'm really accessible. I'm not on social media anymore uh, for my own self care, but um, I'm easy to get in touch with. Absolutely, man. Thank you for your time. Um, we definitely will be in contact uh, further. I got some things in mind, uh, and and I am going to start submitting articles to Abernathy. Word. There we yes. go. There we go. All right. Well, it was an honor uh, to be with you today. I'm, I'm so, um, you know, in the least patronizing way, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. This is Thanks. deeply, deeply important. I'm inspired by you. I'm grateful for your work and your time, and I look forward to working with you uh, on something. Whatever the hell, let's do something. Absolutely. Thank you again, and you have a great day, and I'll talk to you later. Hey, brother. Peace. And that's it for our interview today with Mr. Willie Jackson. Um, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, be sure to subscribe. Be sure to share with someone you care about. And tune in next week for the next edition of Woke Podcast. Peace.